<clears throat> Thank you for tuning in. This is a special multi-platform broadcast of Latino politics and news. I'm Tony Diaz, a Libro Traficante, and I just want to remind folks that this is airing live on social media. The video airs on fox26houston.com. The audio airs on 90.1 FM KPFT, Houston's community station. And of course, as always, I have to remind you that if you are one of our listeners, KPFT is a community broadcast station. We count on listener support. So please, if you can, go to kpft.org and make a donation in the name of Nuestra Palabra, Latino Writers Having Their Say, or Latino Politics and News, so we can do our part to keep this great experiment of freedom of speech going. And today we've got a fantastic lineup of some of the leaders, scholars, activists who are working hard to make sure that our students are served in the classroom, in the community. Today we have an update on, and I'm going to editorialize here. To me, it's heartbreaking that the Texas State Board of Education is not living up to the mission to deliver top-notch quality curriculum to our students because they are not furthering the momentum that has existed to deliver ethnic studies courses to our students. And we're going to get an update on the Texas State Board of Education's recent votes and policy moves about ethnic studies. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to the folks who are joining us first. And I'll let you know, too, at the top, we're going to briefly talk about how this moment sits in the ethnic studies movement across the country, because I'm, I'm scared that Texas is falling way behind the ethnic studies movement. We're going to talk about what's going on in California. The Libro Traficantes will be going out to California during Hispanic Heritage Month 2022 to convene with them. And then we're also going to talk about how this moment fits into the decades-long struggle and, and several decades-long struggle for ethnic studies. Um, but first, I want to let you know who we'll be chatting with. They're all on the screen with us now. I uh, want to thank the folks joining us from several organizations, including the Ethnic Studies Coalition, the Knox de Hasfoco. Shout out to our allies at the Texas Freedom Network. But uh, hey, please wave. Uh, we have Dr. Christopher Carmona with us today live, Dr. Valerie Martinez, Dr. Lauren Scott. We have Lily True. We have Orlando Lara, Andrea Aguirre, Dr. Emilio Zamora, and Annette Anderson, who will be bringing in a lot of perspectives that are really cutting edge. And I want to say one thing. I think this is a powerful example of the community cultural capital building in Texas. And this knowledge is getting to our community. The, the challenge will be, how do we share it with the entire public school system? So I'm going to take the liberty to um, editorialize a little bit about how this fits into the struggle for ethnic studies, especially in relation to the ban of ethnic studies of mixed market studies in Arizona uh, 10 years ago. And then we're going to talk to Dr. Samora about the overall lucha for ethnic studies, which you could go back as far as 50 years with the movement in Califas, if that's one starting point. And then, of course, Dr. Samora's work is in many of the books and has shaped ethnic studies. But I do want to add this as my editorial, um, because I think we're at a certain moment where I, I want to remind folks that um, it is in, on our watch that Arizona right-wing Republican legislators ban Mexican-American studies. I talk about it in my book, The Tip of the Pyramid, Cultivating Community Cultural Capital, which is not just about that moment. I, I'm also talking about Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having to say, and community power, which you're seeing on the screen and which you're living in your home. Um, but I want to remind folks that one, on our watch, there was a state that actively banned Mexican-American studies so that it's not a conspiracy theory that this can be taken away. We've got receipts that tell you that happened. Our community came together and overturned that racist law. And again, that's not my opinion. When that law was overturned, the official uh, mandate from the court said that was a racist law. So that's happened. The other thing I want to remind folks is that 
our community responded to that and we refueled the ethnic studies movement in Texas, where as early as 2010, you had the Texas State Board of Education board members saying crazy things like Dolores Huerta is a communist, uh, refusing to include her in any curriculum at all. Um, that's what the Texas State Board looked like in 2010. What's powerful to me is that a few years later, based on all of our efforts, the Texas State Board of Education winds up in a moment where um, they wind up voting unanimously to endorse Mexican American studies statewide. I do want to remind folks how ugly a fight that was. That was dragged out several years. Uh, that included a moment when a former Texas State Board of Education member tried to introduce a book falsely titled Mex American Heritage that, as all of you will remember, was written by a white former Texas State Board of Education member with all white writers, not one ethnic studies scholar, and included such racist notions such as a definition for Chicanos as people who want to overthrow Western civilization. This would have been in curriculum right now had our community not stood up against that. What I want to remind folks, too, is that if you recall the year that that unanimous vote from the Texas State Board of Education came down, that was the same year that Republican Senator Ted Cruz was being challenged by Beto O'Rourke for Senate, and that race was down to single digits. I point that out because what hasn't really been talked about much is that to me, there's got to be a correlation. At that time, we had six, the, the, the Tejas Foco, Mas Foco, K-12 through Mexican Market Studies Coalition had six press conferences in six regions of Texas at the same time, which is when that state board relented. They didn't say that was why they relented. They didn't say that they relented because perhaps the community angry and fighting for that might tilt that election for many points. And I don't want people to to um, make it seem that I'm saying, hey, we cost the election, because I don't want people to jump to that conclusion either. What I do want to say is that at that time, those were the factors in place when all of a sudden that same Texas State Board of Education unanimously endorsed Mexican American Studies. And then the next year after that, that same school board unanimously endorsed African American Studies. That seemed to be the wonderful era of Texas, which has ended this week, I'm going to say that. And again, I'm editorializing. I want to speak for anyone or any group as an individual. The Libro Traficante is saying this Texas State Board of Education right now looks like they want to drag Texas back to that 2010 era and perhaps that same era when you could see things like Mexican American Studies being banned. And I don't want to stay too mad because the wider ethnic studies movement has had a huge success in California where ethnic studies has been made a requirement for high school graduation. The, the UC university systems require it to graduate as well. They are now working on K through 12 ethnic studies, as well as a certificate to teach ethnic studies in the school. That's what's possible. And that's what the greatest education America can deliver will be like. I'm going to stop there. That's too much editorializing. I'm going to be quiet for the rest of the show. I do want Dr. Zamora to give us a little bit of, uh, additional context because this is at least a 50 year lucha. There's other moments for this, and you're being cited in books in graduate programs, schools across the nation. Dr. Simona, uh, what, what are your thoughts about the legacy of the ethnic studies movement and perhaps Texas's role in it right now? Well, I think uh, the cause for equal representation on the standard curriculum extends back in time and across space. You've already mentioned how there are people in other parts of the country that are equally concerned about providing our youth uh, an expanded view of American history and life, which requires that we begin paying more attention to people that were previously segregated for much of that life and that history. We, we are suggesting that as Americans, we deserve an equal part of that coverage, but it extends back in time. That is our effort to incorporate our experiences in, our, in contemporary life as well as in history. And it goes all the way back to the early 1900s when Mexicans 
were segregated like African Americans from the uh, the standard curriculum, and they then established their own schools that were apart from the mainstream education, and they developed their own curriculum. And in the process, they incorporated themselves into that curriculum. Once they get integrated to, to a great extent by the Second World War, another problem emerged, and that is that the attention of the curriculum writers in places like what is now the Texas Education Agency paid more attention to the, to the Mexicans across the international border than, a, than to the Mexicans across the railroad tracks. That was an issue with LULAC when they be pressed the national state leaders for incorporation to the standard curriculum who are arguing, you know, you're paying it more attention to folks out of the border than you are to Mexicans among you. And of course, increasingly Latinos. Since then, a number of things have occurred, but more recently, as you say, around 2010, we made a, 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 an organized uh, attempt to insert ourselves into the curriculum. We made very sensible arguments. One is that that speaks to the basic uh, philosophical point in American life, and that is that our purpose in, in, on this earth is to acknowledge the other and act accordingly, acknowledge the other person's humanity. That's, that's a, a, an obligation, a moral obligation that we have around the world. And we're proposing that we adhere to the self-defining principle, as well as constitutional rights that we can claim, have been claiming, the right to be seen as part of the national life and history. But in 2010, that's when we began to organize and come together before the State Board of Education, calling, first of all, for uh, the inclusion of Mexican origin people, as well as other people, into the standard curriculum that is used in our public schools. Since then, we added a second purpose that emerges around the 19, uh, I mean, 2000, I suppose around 2018, 2019. And that is that in addition to seeking better full representation, we also began to ask for courses to be adopted by the board that incorporated this curriculum that would expand the offering to all our, our youth in the public schools. So that's when we, the board then responded as they should have and as they did, and we applauded them for adopting courses that school districts could then teach in Mexican-American studies, African-American studies, indigenous studies, and Asian and Pacific Islander studies. I would suggest that the next purpose that we seek is to incorporate women and gender studies. That's my personal opinion. I think women are very underrepresented in the standard curriculum. We're still operating on the big white man uh, approach to the study of history. That is the presidents, the governors. If you only look at those, of course, you're going to be uh, doing a disservice to the women because the women are not getting elected or across time to those positions. So I would say that we democratize, expand the curriculum to also include women and gender studies. Um, uh, we've done uh, analysis of the historical figures that are noted in the curriculum. The group that is least represented are the women, followed very closely by the African-American, Mexican-American, indigenous communities, as well as the Asian communities. So what we've been very patient. We've been um, very cooperative and conciliatory for a long period of time. But the board, in a, broadly speaking, uh, refuses to expand the curriculum, a standard curriculum that now lags far behind all the scholarship that we've been producing since the 1970s. One example, and I'll let others speak. Uh, uh, Alonso Perales, one of the co-founders of the longest running civil rights organization in the country. Alonso Perales, an attorney. Uh, a member of the uh, diplomatic missions, about 24 of them in the 1920s and 30s in the Americas, and also an official delegate to the United Nations who argued against racial discrimination mm -hmm. against Mexicans, but also against the whole racial edifice in this country. He is, does not appear 
in the standard curriculum. And we could spend the whole day talking about folks from all of these communities and organizations and events that are not appearing in the standard curriculum. What we are asking for is a very justified, a very fair proposal that would provide our youth the, the comprehensive, authentic representation of our national experience, which is sorely needed by them, particularly in their intellectual and the social emotional development. They cannot develop appropriately, neither the minority students nor the white students. Thank you so much, Dr. Samora. We really appreciate your insights. And now we'd like to bring in a parent who was testifying at the Texas State Board of Education. She's also a volunteer for the Texas Freedom Network. Uh, her name is Andrea Aguirre. She's also a, a big part of Nuestra Palabra, Latino writers having their say. She's a five-year veteran, middle school teacher with a master's in special education. And she is co-authoring the book, Invisible con ADHD, Real Policy, Real Voices of Latino Students with Nicole Biscotti. Uh, she's producing a documentary about Latino ADHD experience in public education. Andrea, you were there uh, as a parent who loves our community. ¿Qué, qué pensaste tú cuando viste cómo, cómo estaban tratando nuestra historia y la historia de otros? Um, mis papás me hicieron guerrera. My parents did the right thing. They made me a, a fighter, and I appreciate that. Um, and not in the sense of a physical fight, but a mental fight. And I knew I had to be there for my kids, for my students, and for the students that come ahead of us. With 52% uh, Latinos in, in Texas, it is a shame that we are not represented well in, in history. And um, it is, it, it's like made to make us feel shameful. And I don't want that legacy for my children. And as a parent, it's my duty to advocate for them. And as a teacher, it's my duty to advocate for my students as well. And I want to see them represented as long, as well as all of the other BIPOC communities. We are trying to be more cohesive and not divisive. And how do we do that is by learning about one another. And that's the story that we need to tell. And that is the story that we need to fight. And let me tell you that the energy that was at that meeting, um, the youth brought it. The youth fighting for BIPOC studies, for ethnic studies, those testimonies were probably the strongest. They left such an impact on me because they want it. The students want it in droves. And it is a shame that our State Board of Education didn't live up to them because the students were demanding it. It's not some parents, it's not some agencies, it's not some special um, politicians you know, in, in the lurk. It was the students that were there and that left the impact and, and what a shame. We didn't, we didn't do everything that we could, but we're going to keep on going and we're going to keep on fighting for, for their representation. They deserve it. Thank you for putting your time and energy on the line, for getting involved con todo corazón for all that you do. And the specific policy that has brought on this discussion is the Texas State Board of Education delaying a vote on new social studies curriculum to 2025. I'm interpreting that as stonewalling. To me, they're banning our history through procedural changes. And also, I should point out that there's there are elections coming up that will change the body of the Texas State Board of Education. It may lean further right. Um, I also want to say our show will no longer talk about censorship laws as anti-CRT laws. Uh, Dr. Valenzuela reminded us that those are censorship laws. We're talking about censorship laws. Censorship laws seem to be setting the agenda and um, the other thing I would point out too is that this November, this November election for November 2023, to me, clearly will dictate the shape of all policies. So, for example, if you want to stop censorship laws, you need to talk to your elected officials now and candidates running for office. That will have an effect all the way from governor to lieutenant governor, um, you know, to attorney general, to state board of education seats, which then we'll dictate if these elected officials will negotiate with the community reasonably after that. If only candidates who want to support censorship bills win this election 
it's going to undermine our education system. I'm going to stop there. I want to introduce our guests who are visitors um, from the other ethnic studies curriculums besides Mexican American studies, just to show some hospitality. We want our listeners to get used to hearing from them. So we're first going to start with uh, Lily True. She's Interim Executive Director of Asian Texas for Justice, a statewide nonprofit with a mission to connect Asian Texans of all identities to meaningful civil action to build personal and political power for future generations. She's personally passionate about equity and access to quality education as a means for personal and economic empowerment. In 2019, she worked in the Texas House of Representatives on the House Committee on Public Education with the 86th Legislative Session. And in 2018, she was a graduate fellow at the Archer Center for Public Policy. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, what are your thoughts? And also, what, what are your thoughts on the evolution of the, some of the, uh, eth the other ethnic studies curriculums that have not been mandated yet? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, Tony, thank you for, for having me and, and for inviting us to this important conversation. Um, I am just grateful to be in the space with everyone else because the ability to pass additional ethnic studies courses um, is very much riding on the coattails of those who work the Mexican American studies and African American studies um, over the last several years. And so I, I learn something from everybody in this group every day. Um, you know, I, I think from an Asian American studies perspective, we went in really hopeful. Um, but we really went in desperate for this. Um, you know, Asian American youth need this right now. And, and it truly does feel life and death for us. Um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in Texas, we're the fastest growing racial group in our state. If you look at the census numbers, Asian Americans, our population grew 66% in the census um, as compared to a year ago. And so we know that in the near future, in our lifetime, Asian Americans are going to be one of the fastest minority groups in our country. Um, and when the, we're going to continue to be one of the fastest growing ones. We also have one of the largest populations in just sheer numbers. Um, we are third in the country in terms of Asian American population. We're third only after California and New York. So think about the huge number of AAPI youth and students who are dying to see themselves represented in textbooks. And, and when I say that this is life and death for us, it's not an exaggeration. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks probably know that in the last couple of years, there's been a rise in anti-Asian hate. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a lot of hostile attacks. Just last week, there was um, an attack in the Dallas area in Plano, where four women of Indian background were accosted by a woman outside a restaurant who said, go back to India, go back to where you came from. I mean, this is real. And, you know, and we think about our young people. When you think about what our young people are dealing with, Asian American youth is the only youth demographic where suicide is the leading cause of death. Wow. So our young people are really struggling. And we know that if our young people are able to see themselves reflected in their textbooks, if they have a stronger sense of identity, that that's going to help them know how to navigate this world and in a society where Asian Americans still you know, we suffer from large incidents of racism, of misunderstanding, of ignorance. And, and so when this opportunity arose um, for us to present an Asian American studies course, we were very, very hopeful. But like I said, we were desperate for this to pass. And, and, and every minute that this is not in our school's curriculum, our students are suffering. And, and so for me personally, this has been a heartbreaking week. It's been a heartbreaking, you know, few months just seeing our youth come out in droves, like Andrea said, and, and testifying and sharing these deeply personal and painful stories. And for our elected officials to just completely ignore their needs and, and their call for action now. No, thank you for, for breaking it down like that. And I should mention, um, we're in different Texas cities, but in Houston, large Asian American population, and additionally, Fort Bend County is growing uh, by leaps and bounds with a huge Asian American population. It'd be beautiful for us to be able to understand each other's. And you know, as a Chicano, I want to make clear I would totally support my kids taking uh, Asian American studies for us to understand each other better. So we look forward to, to, to talking to you at length, ongoing, and celebrate. I, I for sure we're going to celebrate on this show when it's passed, but it, it's going to take a struggle, but we'll be there with you. So thank you for all that you're doing. Our next guest, we're going to talk to Annette Anderson. She serves on the Council for the Indigenous Institute of the Americas. She collaborated in the writing of the Grand Prairie ISD American Indian Native Studies course for the past two and a half years. 
She's co-founder of the Seed Ambassador Program, Indigenous Grocery Store and Food as Medicine Projects for the IIA. She's been the chairperson for the uh, I, I, I America Celebration, uh, a three-day gathering to highlight authentic knowledge of Native cultures. It's located at the Chismal Trail Outdoor Museum in Claiborne, Texas. She's Chickasaw and Cherokee descent, born and raised in eastern Oklahoma. Thank you for joining us. And, and likewise, uh, could you give us your perspective, as, especially as a, one of the curriculums that we were hoping would be passed, and now we, we are in, in a holding pattern indefinitely? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, we had started working on the Grand Prairie ISD American Indian Native Studies course prior to all of this um, talk about CRT. In fact, I grew up in an age when CRT made cathode ray tube, so I had no idea what we were talking about. <laughs> and in fact, our whole committee, I would say, you know, our focus had nothing to do with politics. We just wanted to create a curriculum that our children and our children's children could be very proud of um, in, the, in the Texas schools. So we kind of got involved in the backlash that was going on without uh, really understanding what we were getting into. So we've worked for two and a half years, monthly, weekly, and sometimes daily on creating this rich, rich curriculum that covers not only American Indians as in federally recognized and state recognized sovereign tribes, but the tribes that were affected in Texas that were detribalized and were um, split off because of a river. And so this course addresses the indigenous populations across the Americas, which is what my organization you know, really represents is from the North Pole to the South Pole. So we need to understand that we're not talking about just 2% of the population as American Indian children being affected. If you look at the his people who mark the box Hispanic, 20 to 40% of those people maintain languages, life ways and ties to their land that are indigenous to the tribes of Mexico uh, and South America and Central America. So, you know, we need to understand that this course impacts a lot of children. And so what Moss, what the Moss course couldn't cover, our course did. And that's where we were so sad and so disappointed when this got pushed out. Now we were told at the end of the SBOE um, session that they recommended that this course go and reapply as an innovative course. We already had done that back in January of 2022. We were encouraged to pull that back and then reapply in this social studies thing with a lot of confidence and, and a really a lot of encouragement from the state board. So I think a lot of us were shocked and, and stunned by what happened uh, this past week. And that's not going to stop us. We're going to encourage other school districts to, you know, grab this course and start teaching it. But to have already been in our second year piloting this program and to have this happen, we were very disappointed, very hurt, I think, would be a good description. Well, and we should remind folks that you're doing this work on a volunteer basis and your expertise could be used in so many ways. So we appreciate you dedicating your time and energy to that. And... You know, I, I personally will add to that. I think it is unacceptable to relegate these wonderful, rich curriculums to innovative courses because that obscures them, that hides them. And we've already seen that game. Again, I'm not, you know, I'm editorializing, uh, but we've seen this pr procedural game before. It's unacceptable. And we look forward to celebrating the passing of, uh, of your curriculum. And of course, you, you mentioned where they overlap as well, which is very, very powerful. Um, we want to bring in uh, Dr. Lawrence Scott, who currently serves as an assistant professor of educational leadership at Texas A&M University, San Antonio, being the first African-American to be awarded San Antonio Business's Journal 40 Under 40 Man of the Year in 2018, was indicative to Dr. Scott's insatiable passion to make an indelible impact on the lives of others through education. He's dedicated his life to changing success trajectories for students at all age levels and demographic backgrounds. Prior to teaching in higher education, Dr. Scott served over 16 years in the K-12 sector as a secondary teacher, coach, school counselor, district level curriculum specialist, 
an administrator in San Antonio ISD, a district in which he is an alum. Um, Dr. Scott, give us give us your take on the current state of affairs and, and where should we be in Texas? Yes, sir. First of all, uh, Tony, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, assembling, it's like the Avengers. We're assembling all the, the, uh, the members of Avengers together uh, around Texas to fight for this very important cause. Um, well, first of all, how did we get here? All right, so there's a gentleman named Christopher Rufo, I'm gonna call him by name, uh, with the Manhattan Institute. He essentially you know, did a documentary and he wrote uh, some ideas that Donald Trump saw on Fox News, picked up, did a, a, an executive order uh, that banned uh, any type of diversity training for uh, uh, you know, governmental entities. And then from there, we had a, a slew of cookie cutter bills that were promulgated all over uh, legislatures all over uh, the nation. And so Texas adopted our first one, of course, uh, HB 3979, Florida HB 7, uh, Tennessee SB 603, Virginia 7, uh, uh, 781. Um, so, you know, you had all these different bills all around uh, the nation, essentially, like we said, uh, banning any talk of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and conflating DEI and equity with critical race theory. Now, there was a, there was a study, Silent Epidemic, of uh, the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, and they found that 47% of students uh, that dropped out, they dropped out because school was just not interesting. And what we're saying is, with this whole movement, is we, we you know, when, when you go and you go back to your high school and uh, you look at your books, right, what do you look for? Well, you look for yourself and you look mm -hmm. for your friends. But unfortunately, our students do not see themselves reflected in, in the curricula at all. So, for instance, I tell people all the time, when, when, when did you hear about Black Wall Street, right? So a, a lot of times we don't want to talk about Black Wall Street where you had a burgeoning Black, amazing group of African-Americans who had, they had their own private planes. We had money flow. Everything was amazing. But they don't want to talk about that because then you have to talk about the Tulsa Massacre. Right, it was actually bombed. <laughs> the whole place was bombed. Or then you have to talk about Rosewood, right? The destroying of burgeoning black communities and cities. Um, and so uh, another thing, we, we don't talk enough about Harlem Renaissance or uh, yeah, writers yeah. like Sanders and Sinettles, like we just talked about, Dolores Huerta, hidden figures. A lot of us didn't know about the hidden figures. You know, the uh, the, the mathematician mm -hmm. until the movie came out. Um, everyone knows about Robin Hood, Three Musketeers, uh, and everyone knows about Count of Monte Cristo. But a lot of you don't know that was actually written by a black person, a black Frenchman. We don't talk about that, right? But we don't talk about Shakespeare, C.S. Lewis, Charles Dickens, and the Bronte. So I think if we, we, you know, I think what's going to happen is what has to happen is we're going to have to supplement, or like we've been doing, uh, supplement the education. A lot of people that we heard um, uh, the other day at the state board, they were saying, you know, the parents, why not leave it to the parents? And I love what Valerie Martinez says about the experts. Dr. Martinez, you have to repeat that about the, you know, expertise of the experts. But I was thinking about it, you know, and I have kids that are in public school, they're teenagers. And I was thinking about when I was in school as a, you know, I'm a parent now, but when I was in school, my, my history was incomplete. I didn't learn about all the wonderful contributions that, I, that we know about today through the Ethnic Studies Network. What we, what we hear about is, you know, you know, we're enslaved people, we're conquered people. Something about Martin King being good, Malcolm X is bad, and there was a lady named uh, uh, Rosa Parks. And so I think what we need to do is we need to somehow supplement, all right, and perhaps even some plant, but supplement the curricula uh, with, our, with our students, keep on promoting the, the need for ethnic studies, uh, like, uh, like again, like your show is doing today, mm -hmm. and figure out a way that we can counterbalance these bills that are all over the nation because right mm -hmm. now, you know, they're they're ripping up the fabric. I, I'm a bridge builder and I try to bring camps together, mm -hmm. uh, but they're ripping up the fabric of unification because what's happening is we can't have critical coaching conversations because we all don't agree mm -hmm. on the same history. Thank you. No, I appreciate those insights. And what I'd, I would like to add is, um, you know, in my book, I chronicle our, our uh, contributions to um, – overturning the ban of ethics studies in Arizona. Obviously that was a movement work, but one thing I wanna say is that what you're touching on as well is that back then, all of us were able to contain that racist law to Arizona and focus our efforts here. As you pointed out right now, it's spread all over. Uh, and, and that makes it very much a different challenge uh, in order to attack that. Uh, we're gonna run to Dr. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
Uh, I'm gonna we're gonna run to uh Dr. Martinez because you gave her a shout out. You said <laughs> you wanted to come on board, and of course, our, our uh, she's a dear friend of Nuestra Palabra, uh, La Lucha, and folks who listen to our programs are familiar with her. Uh, we'll remind you, she specializes in 20th century Mexican American history, U.S. history, U.S. military and labor history, and women's and gender studies. And she's a core member of the Ethnic Studies Network of Texas and the chair of the National Association for Chicano and Chicano Studies, the House Focal Pre-K to 12 Committee. Uh, and you are the history program head at Our Lady of the Lake, University of San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Martinez, so uh, we have a request for your, for your phrase. So break it down for us. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Scott, for this. So this is coming off of, I had provided my testimony and my testimony very much centered on the current political context of fear and how that is a driving influence on this board. And um, board member Bell Mitaru and on Fridays at Friday's board meeting actually called them on it. They said that you are, this is the fear, this is the power of these far right groups that is driving the decisions of the board. Now, even though chairs Chair Ellis countered that point. We all know what's going on. We know that it is this fear. It is this fear of a perceived loss of power, right? So this is my whole testimony um, on Tuesday. Well, then following me comes these other folks, uh, a former Texas House rep, and he starts saying that you, we have to put the pig, no, the lipstick on the pig of what is cultural Marxist running this. And he says that you need to not follow the experts and this and this and that. And here we are. I, I mean, I'm shaking. I'm so mad and just waiting for, you know, board member Aisha Davis or Marisa. Somebody's like, bring me in, coach. Call me back up. <laughs> but <laughs> afterward, uh, we were thinking, okay, all of you people who are who are dogging these experts who have spent years, right? I'm at almost 20 years studying this, and I know Dr. Zamora can put all the decades worth of, of, of information, content, knowledge, experience, right, that we have. Um, and yet, you know, just throw all that out the window. Go follow what your mom says. Okay, that's fine. But um, I mean, as a parent and as a mother and as a daughter, when I break my arm. You know, my mom's going to tell me, go call the doctor. What are you doing coming over here? So all these other folks who are just completely blasting as experts of, he said that we have fancy titles and pieces of paper. Okay, that's cool. But when you need that tooth pulled, who are you going <laughs> to go to? When you need that root canal, when that arm is broken, you're going to go to your experts, right? And yet here we are. So that's that was the comment on <laughs> on this question about going to the experts of them not trusting us with this content knowledge, with this experience, right? Fine. When you need a new root canal, I don't want to see you at that doctor's office. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. No, that's a great point. I want, I don't want my relatives, uh, YouTubing how to heal my broken arm. Yeah, yeah. No, we need experts. Uh, and we'll be calling on you now as the chair for the, uh, K through 12 master have spoken, uh, throughout the year. Uh, I want to I want to throw it to um, and we have two more guests. And then, of course, we want to round robin and, and talk about what is next, just so that people know that this is just one step in a legacy movement. We do have to calculate how to proceed forward with these policies, continue our community. Um, but we got two more folks. Uh, Orlando, um, like he's a critical on. race and ethnic studies scholar, legal and po uh, political anthropologist, cultural organizer in writing. Doctoral candidate in anthropology with emphasis in race and justice at UC Irvine, and uh, working on a literary ethnographic uh, ethnography of citizenship review and invalidation in the U.S. borderlands. Co-founder Ethnic Studies Network of Texas, and works with educating, organizing, community leaders to grow ethnic studies in Texas at all grade levels. Uh, Orlando, what are your thoughts about this stage, and what do you see as the path forward? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Tony. Um, sorry for the long bio. <laughs> um, there's so much to say. I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Scott and what, uh, what you mentioned after he spoke uh, is right on. I think we do, we are still in a state of sort of analyzing who our opponent is because I think that has changed. Uh, whereas you know, before the opponent often was the State Board of Ed. We were trying to persuade them just to like vote in favor of ethnic studies. And I think one thing that has shifted in the past year and a half is that we now are sharing the stage, sharing the room with a very well-funded, well-organized far-right 
lobby, you know, Moms for Liberty, the some of the, uh, the Texas Policy Foundation that are very actively putting misinformation out, you know, and so it's it's a different opponent now, and that's happening at the national level. Thankfully, there is a, a national ethnic studies coalition that's been forming for the past year, that's still developing, and uh, we're in touch with them. So, you know, we're meeting the challenge. Um, and then the folks in this space, this is not the first time we've talked to each other. There, this has been uh, many meetings and, you know, before we came on, we were joking, it's, it's nice to finally be outside of the Zoom space. We're talking to each other in a broader context. Um, so we're actually more organized ourselves. I think we're more in touch with each other. Uh, and we've developed uh, this new coalition, the Ethnic Studies for Texas Schools Coalition, which is really sort of putting us in touch with bigger orgs like AFT, uh, uh, Texas Freedom Network. And it's helping ethnic studies to now uh, help shape the larger sort of uh, discourse and agenda in, in progressive education in Texas. So all that is good. Um, the board with this decision now, it's, it's kind of a weird moment because they, they voted 13 in favor to call for American Indian studies and Asian American studies right next year. So they didn't totally turn their back on ethnic studies. They didn't say cut ethnic studies. Um, but what they did is they put the courses, especially the new courses into the mouth of the lion, right? Which is this new, more conservative board. So the now for the first time I'm hearing folks, because we've always said ethnic studies now, ethnic studies now, for the first time uh, we're hearing folks saying, maybe it's not the best time. Maybe we need to uh, develop these courses in our own communities through districts and kind of circumvent the SPOE while we try to change its composition. That's a new conversation. Um, but the other thing I'll say that, that shifted and, it, and I think it took us a little while to get there, is that we are now no longer just talking about ethnic studies electives. This whole process was really held up by people having complaints about this new K-8 framework, which really was not that radical. But what it was doing, it was putting Texas history in context of US history, in context of world history. And for some people, especially the far right, they saw that as diluting you know, Texas essentialism, American essentialism, which needs to be diluted. You know, that, that, that is, uh, there's very dangerous, uh, there's a very dangerous history of what happens when you move into what is really hyper, hyper nationalism. Um, but I think the, the shift is that now we're saying, wait a minute, how can we apply our ethnic studies knowledge to now reshape the entire curriculum and to now think about not just like what we want, what content we want to add, um, but where we want to add it. How do we want to get this content to younger learners? And how do we want to change the whole framework of what social studies is, right? And that's the new conversation. And I think we should jump into that and keep having it, even as we're fighting to get these uh, ethnic studies courses, in, which I think we're going to get in. We, we can get them in. It's just a question of, when do, what board do we want to present it to? Uh, so I'll leave it there, Tony. Thank you for everything uh, that you guys have done to open the doors and to get this board to support ethnic studies. It's right now, they're just, they got cold feet and, they, and they're not moving as fast as they could have and they've, and they've thrown us into the fire. No, no. Uh, likewise, thanks for, for all that uh, you're working on and, and the networks you're bringing together. But I appreciate your assessment because maybe that's what we have to do is inform the public of, of the larger approach. Um, it's not hopeless, like you're saying. Um, at the end of the day, we got to do everything ourselves anyway. You know, all of it. We got to do. If we don't do it, no one will. And worse, if we're not on it, it can get erased or ignored. So maybe that's one thing we have to remind folks. But I think it is. Uh, wonderful to be able to to organize at a national level across different demographics, and I think that is a legacy and powerful sign of our of our movement, which is totally fair and just. Um, last but not least, and I would like then to to have folks uh, give give uh, uh, some insights about uh, the future uh, is Dr. Christopher Carmona, who is again a, a dear friend of our of our cause. 
Uh, we stole him from the, the Valley. Now he's, in, now he's in San Antonio. He's an assistant professor of creative writing uh, and the coordinator for Mexican American Studies. Well, not anymore for the Bronze again. <laughs> no, I'm going to have to gloss over that because now you're, you're in San Antonio and uh, a member of the Ad Hoc Committee for the Texas State Board of Education for Mexican American Studies, uh, Knox Tejas Focal Committee on Implementing Mexican American Studies Pre-K through 12, and you're a writer, and you've got uh, three books of poetry and a book of short stories, as well as a series of YA novels called El Rinche, and now you are here in uh, San Antonio. So welcome to San Antonio, <laughs> yeah. Christopher. Christopher, uh, you've been involved in this battle at, at different levels. Um, what's your thoughts about strategies moving forward? Well, thanks, Tony. So just uh, to give um, Tony a little, uh, I guess, break here. So I'm at Our Lady of the Lake now. <laughs> and I'm an associate professor of uh, Mexican-American studies and English. But yeah. Um, so strategies going forward is, so I'm just going to say it. Um, I, with the, this, I have no faith in the State Board of Education and doing anything good for um, social studies or any of our ethnic studies courses. None. Um, a lot less faith than I had when we were pushing the MOS course years ago. Um, and so I think that the best strategy um, that we can do at this point is political. And we have to make political moves, which means we have to attack their constituencies with and flood them with the real information, get there. And so we have to look more at a political angle of pushing for really um, school boards, Get, the, basically what the Republicans have been doing is invading the school board systems. Um, we have the people, like you said, we are at um, actually 73.5% students of color in the state of Texas. So that's a super majority according to the U.S. Senate, right? <laughs> For getting anything passed, and yet we don't have a curriculum that represents it. So what we're listening to right now is really the 23% um, that are uh, that are uh, the curriculum that is represented as 100% of the curriculum, right? So we have a very undemocratic way of, of viewing our own history, our own our own education. In order to flip that, um, we need to take back or take seats from the state board of education. We need to take seats into the legislature, and we need to reclaim the space there because all the work we've been doing for 10 years. And you know, Tony, we've been in this for, since for a long time, and Emilio and, and a lot of you guys, all the work that we did to get the MOS class is getting unmade. Um, and the reason for that is because we're still relying on 15 people to control the entire education system in the state of Texas. That is a huge problem. And then also people mm -hmm. don't, most of the people in the state don't even know, know we have a school board of education or a state right. board. Right. And, I'm and laughing from anxiety. Okay. Yeah. They, they don't usually get cameras into their into their meetings until we're there, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're not used to operating under the radar. And we have to make it very much in the public eye. These are who the people these are the 15 people that are controlling all what is it, 5.3 million students in the state. And you know, who, who like the, the people, we have, what, four Democrats on the on the state board? And um, those are basically the four people of color as well. Um, and so, you know, this is a very much run by 15 people with a constituency that are very small. Um, if you think about it, because the major, the major ones, the Democratic seats, control the major cities, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, Houston, El Paso, the Rio Grande Valley, all that area which is primarily people of color, Rasa and others, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the approach is I'm done trying to explain to these people what education is. We have to get them out. And that requires a very political move, like what we did when they tried to change our name. We mm -hmm. did the Six City um, Public uh, basically press conference, and we pushed them on many different levels. Mm -hmm. And that's what scared them. I, don't, I mean... There's no other way to interpret it. We were working for years before we mm. did moves like that, and they did nothing. Push us until finally we pushed them politically, and we kept them in the news over and over and over. If we don't do that, if we don't keep them in the spotlight, 
this is going to continue to happen. Sorry to sound so angry here, but <laughs> no, long time. No, I think you're dropping true knowledge because you know what? Looking back, there was a brief moment in history then where where ethnic studies did not appear to be just a Democratic issue or Republican issue because there was a unanimous vote. We had a unanimous vote. So both Republicans and Democrats wanted to support curriculum for all students. As you're pointing out, due to election waves and this movement of the, um, you know, um, the success of the censorship laws, right now then, the far right wants to appear as if they've abandoned ethnic studies and Democrats want to appear as if they're supporting it. So the point you make is really powerful coming up with this next election because you have Greg Abbott, Texas governor, is in a single digit race against Beto O'Rourke. You've got uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick in a single digit race against Tom Collier. You have Kemp Paxton in a single digit race against uh, Rochelle Garza. And I'll tell you what, we're going to have all of them. We're going to invite all of them on our show. And we're going to make sure people know who accepted the invitation and who didn't. And they should all be supporting the best curriculum for our youth, as you're pointing out. And the last thing I want to say about it, because I do want to get to Valerie. Uh, she had an issue she wanted to bring up. I do want to point something out. Governor Abbott had a special session to bring in censorship laws. Dan Patrick said that at the next legislative session, he will go after tenure for professors, which I know most parents don't care about. And I got, I, we got professors, I'm like, here's what I mean. The argument Republicans are going to use is going to say, hey, you can get fired from your job. Why can't they? So most parents aren't going to appreciate that. We're going to have a, a loss of intel intellectuals. All the professors we want, they're going to go to other states where they can have intellectual freedom. Dan Patrick also said he's going to go after professors who teach critical race theory. That's a curriculum not taught at K through 12. That is taught at the upper level uh, higher education. So he's, he's going to attack teachers. And finally, Ken Paxton said he will spend state money defending a lawsuit in Yano County where a librarian was suing the, were suing the library because they were stepping on freedom of speech. So he's going he's gonna to spend tax money to help uh, people that are against freedom of speech. So if those three people stay in power, like you're saying, it's not exactly what you said, Christopher. Those, those three people in power, you're right. They can undo laws that have taken decades to make overnight at a special session. Uh, Valerie, um, you, you had an issue that you wanted to bring up that you said was very, very important. Yeah, just to let folks know the spaces that we've been working under. So we know that these are these are spaces of institutional violence, like just to put it out there, right? Please. Just to have honest, truthful conversations here. These spaces were not made by us. They were not made for us. So you could feel the negativity within the, the state board hearings, right? You could just feel this, right? Um, but also while working with the TEA. Now, there are some allies that we have that are working within the um, different various spaces, right? On the board, we have supportive members at TA, we have supportive staff, but as a space of, 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 as these institutional spaces, these are violent spaces. Now, I had the opportunity to work on the working group alongside Lily. We were in working group E and uh, several of our member members faced violence, not Terrible. physical violence, but emotional. They were they were attacking our work. They were attacking our frameworks. Terrible. Frameworks that have been constructed by our elders, by those within the discipline, that these are our best practice, practices, methodologies, right? Our, pedago our pedagogical frameworks, right? That we're using, these analytical lenses that allow us to promote this accurate, inclusive history. Um, they were attacking these. I mean, standing over your so your shoulder, constantly surveilling your your everything, your typing, every move. So it was it was very, it was just very chaotic faces, and and people in each of these groups faced very violent um, interactions with some members. I mean, to the to that honestly put some folks in tears. 
and I won't name the, the, the members who face this to allow them that, that space to come and tell their own stories. But this was felt in each of our groups. It was really hard working in. Again, there's some supportive folks there, but there was a lot that were attacking our work. And again, That's this terrible. is based off of experience in and our expertise. Intimidation tactics. This is like backwoods, Texas, uh, which I thought were stereotypes, but that's terrible. We usually don't have this many guests at one show, but this was such an important <laughs> issue that we wanted to, to have each one. So I apologize if we, not everybody got as much time as they could have. I thank you all for your deep insights. I would like to propose, uh, I'll, I'll call on some folks, if you can give us a, a, a short statement to, to fire us up as this cause continues. And of course, we look forward to having you with this. Uh, we're at your service, having you back on. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Scott. Parting words to fire us up, please. Yes, sir. So uh, author Kimberly Jones has the uh, Monopoly analogy. She says, uh, you know, you, you had about 345 years of playing Monopoly. And then you're saying, OK, black and brown people go. And then so we're playing catch up. Right. You already own Park Place. You already own Boardwalk. Right. So mm. they have this bootstrap argument. Why don't they just work hard? You know, like I said, 345 years juxtaposed to about 60 years of freedom. We have a lot of we have two, three generations versus 20 generations. We have a lot of catching up to do. In order for us to address the inequities and disparities, we have to be able to have cogent, critical conversations about race and reconciliation based on actual truths. And that needs to start in the classroom. Because if we don't do it in the classroom, they're going to take it to TikTok. Love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott. Uh, Lily True, please, uh, we'd love to have some parting words from you to, to inspire us. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I think, you know, like someone said earlier, I'm still really angry, so I'll try to inspire. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost 40, and I am just now doing the work of learning what it means to be Asian American mm. in this country, because it was never taught to me. And one of the earliest things I started to learn was about the Third World Liberation Front and learning about how youth in the 60s, mm. Black and brown youth, Asian, Chicano, Black, Indigenous youth came together together to demand for ethnic studies at the higher education level, how they came together um, as activists to resist against systems of oppression. And so when I think about them, like I get goosebumps because I look at the faces on this call and like, th this is our moment to reclaim that. And so I know in, in the Asian American community, we have benefited so much from civil rights leaders. Um, so much of what we've been able to accomplish in the last 50 or 60 years have been in partnership with other groups, right? I think about Larry Itliong, the, the Filipino farmer who worked in partnership with Cesar Chavez for labor rights. Mm -hmm. I think about Yuri Kochiyama, who worked with Malcolm X during the civil rights mm -hmm. movement for racial justice for all. There are so many examples of this. And so I just want to remind folks that, that we are all in this fight together. The ethnic studies is really something that will benefit all of us, BIPOC and otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. We know white students benefit from this as well. Um, so I am in this fight with everyone here. And, and you know, I, I know we will get there. And in the meantime, we're going to deliver everything we can to the kids. We're not waiting for elected officials. We're going to keep getting out there. We're going to we're going to do it grassroots. We're going to deliver this to kids in whichever way we have to. But it's going to happen. Thank you so much. And that that is very inspiring. Uh, Annette Anderson, please. Uh, what parting words would you like to share with with our uh, listeners and viewers? I would say in our community, we have that seventh generation responsibility. Mm -hmm. Seven generations behind us have been brought to where we are, but we need to think about the seven generations in front of us. Our course needs to be taught in as many schools as possible. So for the listeners that are on this call, mm -hmm. please reach out to your school district and say, hey, there's a beautiful course. If we've mm -hmm. got a teacher willing to teach it, we've got people who will help them teach it. So, you know, we're working on a curriculum, you know, guide, we're working on, um, you know, supporting these teachers. So it's not a scary thing to pick up these courses, whether they were approved or not, the, these, these innovative courses can be taught anywhere at this point. Don't let people stop you. So um, reach out, reach out to me, reach out to Grand Prairie ISD. We just want to spread it out. They'll find out it's not threatening. <laughs> That's powerful. Thank you. And thank you for reminding us that we do have the power. Uh, Orlando, Orlando, uh, parting words. Sure. I, I mean, I'll just say, you know, I, I, I'm trying to think of these, these battles that we engage in as 
kind of like workouts, you know, where after a really good workout, you're in pain and it hurts and that's what we're in. But then you rebuild your muscles, you know, and you, you go out and you get stronger. And I think that's what happens every this past year, two years, even as this backlash has been, you know, out there, it's mobilized so many of our folks. Mm -hmm. It's gotten, it's alarmed so many of our folks. And I know that this latest move, you know, really it's, it's something to laugh at. You know, they gave themselves two years to do Google research, right? <laughs> That's what they did because they didn't have the guts to actually do this now. And, and it's, uh, you know, I'm sure it, it puts Texas in a bad light. And I, for the first time, I'm seeing the news reports coming out. And it's, and it's progressive teachers that are trolling. It's not the right. It's the left that's <laughs> laughing at these decisions. So I, I think the support is growing and our task is just to organize ourselves and get in touch with that support and, and just keep fighting back. Thank you, you know, everybody. Yeah. No, thank you. And actually, you're making me remember, I thought graduate school would look like the conversation in here. I guess it took us working together to, to make that happen. Uh, Andrea, I, I take it you're still going to be luchando for your family and for all families. Well, yes. There's 74% of uh, our students in Texas that are BIPOC. We need to wake up. What I'm fighting for is for students to um, make a difference. Up. Most parents also need to come in and get involved. There's so many professionals that are willing to teach. Just start asking questions, showing up, show up to those board meetings. Demand that change from the very from your schools, from your board meetings, all the way up. We can do it. But we need the help and we have the representation and it's time is now. If you don't like school, time is now. Wake up and say something because you have the power. Thank you for all that corazón. Uh, Christopher, um, what are your thoughts? So my last party thoughts is we started doing this before the legislature, before the state board really started to consider us. And we're going to continue to do it no matter what. I mean, but um, we've grown from what um, I think the last time we checked back in 2018, we we're at 40 districts teaching Mexican American studies. Mm -hmm. Now we're at 143 of that are teaching either Mexican American, African American, or a mixture of the two. Mm -hmm. So we've grown 100 different districts in the past few years. And those are courses that mm -hmm. are special topics and things of that nature, which are not necessarily TEA courses. Mm -hmm. But this is all done because we have had the success of creating our own teaching academies, training our own summits, bringing this information to the people around Texas, which has had nothing to do with the school board or the state board. Um, just want to let you know that this is a lot of the fact that we have done and we can do no matter what. That's hard to Love it. <laughs> And Valerie, as the chair of the Tejas Focal K-12, we'll be having a summit in July, right? Coming up in person. Yes. And as everybody's been saying, just because the board didn't okay it, didn't approve, was derailed, delayed, didn't do their job this time around, it doesn't mean that we're stopping. So we are continuing. We have, uh, as Annette was saying too, we are we have different types of, of professional development for, for teachers who want to teach this material. We have it for all ethnic studies content. So please, if you want to learn either any of these fields, we can most definitely help you. We have a lot of great uh, programming folks. So we, we want to trust your communal knowledge, right? We, uh, we do have information and knowledge that is passed down. We want to incorporate that and we do incorporate that within our development session. So we'll have our MAS Summit. We have the MAS Teachers Academy. We have the Ethnic Studies Convergence. We have the African-American, uh, um, it's also a part of the larger Ethnic Studies Academy that they do out of UTSA. There's different, different growing areas. So please, please reach out to any of us and we can most definitely direct you to resources. But, you know, sigue la lucha. We're not so, stop. I wanted to save Dr. Samora for last. Dr. Samora, what are the history <laughs> books going to say about our, our movement in the future? They're going to say that we made reasonable, fair arguments, pedagogical, scholarly, demographic, constitutional, and moral arguments. And they're also going to say the people that were in power in 2022 
should have recognized mm -hmm. that the genie was out of the bottle. There was no stopping these, these causes. All of the arguments that we've made give us strength. Our numbers are growing. I understand that there's replacement-based fears, but understand that we are not unreasonable. We're asking you to open the door so that we can participate. I would ask people to look up the addresses of all the members of the State Board of Education. And if you agree with us and you want to join with us, you can join by writing to them and telling them to be reasonable and fair. This, we don't have to, we shouldn't have to fight over this especially because the horizon is already telling us that the genie is out of the bottle. You cannot put it back in. We've been at it for the long run, and I'm speaking for myself. I am not going to quit in this cause. We are dedicated to this cause because it is a fair and just cause. It is for our children and mm -hmm. for our future not only as, a, as communities, but as a nation. We mm -hmm. are super patriotic in this regard. We are working for the Republic. We want to save it. We don't want to destroy it. Please understand that when we send our best to you, people that are experienced, published, and so forth, give them the respect that they're due. That ought to be enough for your listeners to be moved enough to write those letters. Thank you very much, Tony. And thank you, the audience as well. Thank all of you for all the work that you're doing and for keeping this movement going. Uh, hey, this is Tony Diaz, Libro Traficante. I want to thank Roxana Guzman, who is our multi-platform broadcast producer. I want to thank Rodrigo Bravo, who is our audio producer and mixes all of our shows. I want to thank all of our team from Nuestra Palabra, uh, thank you for tuning in to Latino Politics and News and continue to fight for cultura. Gracias. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.